Jesus. Jesus continuing his prayer to his father. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them, in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. That they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in in the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I consecrate myself, that they may also be sanctified in in truth. I do not ask for these these only, but but also for those who will believe in me through their words. That That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me, that the glory that you have given me, I have given them, and they may be one, even as we are one. In them, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you loved me. Father, I... Father... I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see the glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that I have sent, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Well, what if we had a strategy that would convince our friends that we really are followers of the Lord Jesus and that he is worth knowing and following. What if God had told us how to do that? Well, he has. I'll read two sentences and leave a word blank in each one. You see if you can guess what the word is. Jesus said, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you... Get the doctrine of the Trinity right? That would be good to do, but that's not it. If you show that you're happier than those people who don't belong to the Lord Jesus. If you do some wonderful miracles, then people will know. No, he says in John 13, 35, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. That's what Jesus said to them after he, Jesus, had self-forgetfully and humbly got down on his knees and washed their feet. He served people who didn't deserve it. He said, now if you do that, that's going to be compelling for people who look on. There's a second part to the strategy. When uh, he prays for us and for all who follow him, that they may be what? He asks in his prayer that they may all be so that the world may believe that you sent me. It was in our reading this morning, we just had, that they may all be one, John 17 verse 21, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. When people see deep unity between the followers of the Lord Jesus, it has an impact. It changes people. It not only convinces people that we're genuine. Jesus said there, 
they'll believe that you, Father, have sent me. They'll believe something about Jesus. You see, we live in a world of double talk and hypocrisy and pretense. In a world, I think, that increasingly people say, can you give us something authentic, real, honest? When do you think Christians are most compelling in a world that lacks authenticity? Jesus said, when we are one. So it says something about us, and it says something about the authenticity of the Lord Jesus. Folks, unity is, unity is a pretty uh, rare sort of thing, deep unity. I mean, we, we, we have different cultures, we have different colours, we have different financial backgrounds, we're different temperamentally, and uh, a lot of the differences that are just natural to us. But until something shows across those differences, until humble, self-denying, get-on-your-knees sort of love shows itself across those differences, uh, we've foregone the strategy that God gave us that the Lord Jesus gave us, that will convince people of something about us and something about himself. Yes, we are still in John chapter 17, which is the prayer of the Lord Jesus, a long prayer, but uh, one that's just packed full of uh, wonderful things that will give us insight into the heart of the Lord Jesus. He began the prayer praying for himself, verses 1 to 5. Then in the middle section, verses 6 to 19, he prayed for his disciples, these guys, these apostles who were with him. And then lastly, in the prayer, he prays for us. He prays for us, he prays for you. Verse 20, I do not ask for these only, the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's praying for people who... Oh, he's praying for 3,000 Jews who six weeks later on the day of Pentecost are going to turn to believe in him. He was praying for them. He was praying for that, those ladies who met at the early morning prayer meeting in Philippi who believed in him. He was praying for them. They believed through the words of the apostles. He was praying for the Greeks in Athens. He was praying for Christians in Tamworth in 2024, I pray for those who believe in me, Jesus, through the words of the apostles. What does he pray for? What does he want for you? There are two, uh, there are two things he prays for. One will come to next week. But in this world, what does he want for us? To be happy? Um, to find life pretty easy? That's not what he prays. His heart says, Lord, I pray that they may be perfectly one. Now, what's that look like? What does unity between Christians really look like? Well, I tell you, I think it grows out of two things. And I want to talk about those two things this morning and then see what it looks like. Let's see what, what uh, produces the right kind of unity that Jesus says is so impressive and convincing and compelling. And the first thing he talks about is the certainty of God's kingdom. The certainty of God's kingdom. I don't know whether the word struck you in verse 20 when we read, there's one word to, to my mind anyway that stands out as being quite a remarkable word. Jesus says, I do not ask for these apostles only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Another word that stood out to me, they will believe. The apostles are not the end of the line. It's not as though somehow everything's now at risk and it might all collapse. No, there's going to be a whole bunch of people who will believe. It's a word of certainty. Jesus doesn't say they might believe or I hope somebody somewhere believes because really that's all you can say if, if, if the final decision about a person becoming a Christian is down to us. 
if we're the ones who make that decision ultimately, and it all rests with us, then there's no guarantee anybody's going to believe. And indeed, given what we're like, there's a guarantee that nobody's going to believe if it's down to us. But Jesus sees something bigger than that. I pray for those who will believe. There are those who are going to come through the words that I've spoken to trust me and follow me. Uh, in this prayer we've, we've seen in, in the past few weeks, uh, he's already prayed for his apostles. And he says, they are those whom you've given me out of the world. The bottom line is, the apostles didn't choose themselves to follow the Lord Jesus. In, in fact, Jesus said to them on one occasion, you didn't choose me, I chose you. That's the bottom line. And that's the bottom line for every Christian. You can say, yeah, I believed. He says, yeah, yeah, but it's not because you believed that I chose you. I chose you, and that's why you believed. Jesus says there are those who will believe. At the same, uh, back in chapter 6, we, you won't remember back, I don't know when we were back in chapter 6 of John's Gospel, but in verse 37 of chapter 6, he says, all whom the Father gives me will come to me. There are those who will come. There are those who will believe. Every chapter of John's Gospel throbs with certainty that this is not the end of the road when Jesus dies. When he's left with just 12 disciples, most of whom are pretty ordinary sort of blokes and really didn't have much going for them. It's not the end. There are those whom the Father has chosen. There are those whom the Father will call because he's given them to the Son and they will believe. It's a word of great certainty. Well, you, you may have had parents who prayed for you or friends who prayed for you to become a Christian. And there was never any guarantee that you would. I mean, if they looked at you, they must have thought it was a pretty hopeless sort of uh, uh, cause, really. But when the father can say, no, I've given this person to the son, and he will believe. The time will come when he will believe. It's a word of absolute certainty. And we're, we're, who are these? How many of these people are going? How many are there who are going to believe? Well, when John writes the book of Revelation, he says, it's a multitude that's so big you can't count. Millions and millions and millions and millions of people are going to believe. And where are they all coming from? Well, he also says in the book of Revelation, that from every tribe and every language group and every nation. This is an expansionary kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. It not just, doesn't get just this far and then that's it. No, his vision is it's going to grow and expand and it's going to thrive because it's certain because of the choice of the Father. Folks, there's so much in this world that's not certain. I mean, you, 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 you can't be certain you'll be alive this time tomorrow. You can't be certain that the money in the bank that you've stashed away is safe. and It'll be there when you need it. You can't be certain about the holiday plans you've made or the retirement plans or the plans you've made for your career or your marriage. You can't be certain. There's nothing certain in this world. This is certain. That the kingdom of Jesus will flourish, will grow, and everyone given by the Father to the Son will believe. It's an absolute certainty. You might say, well, what's that got to do with unity? Well, quite a bit, really. If I said to you, who are you called primarily to love? Now, I need to be clear. Are, are we to love all men? Yeah, we are. Are we to do good to all men? Sure, the Bible says that. But who are we primarily to love? Those whom the Father has loved <laughs> from all eternity. None of them is a nobody. None of them you can say, I'll dispense with him. He doesn't matter. She doesn't matter. She's a nothing. You can't say that. These are people loved by the Father in eternity, chosen in grace, given to the Son, called by the words of Jesus to come to him. In the family of God, nobody's a nobody, if I can put it like that. And what have you been called, what have you been called into You've been called into a family. When you came to the Lord Jesus, 
You didn't come and say, well, now it's just Jesus and me and we're just happy here. No, no, you came into a family. Jesus was always about building a family, building a kingdom, uh, building a church. And uh, we belong to Jesus. And I, I tell you, look, you've got more in common. If you're a Christian this morning, you've got more in common with Christians in China and Chile and anywhere else than you have with people in Australia who don't follow the Lord Jesus. That's more. It's almost as though nationality and cultural background doesn't matter. And it doesn't. It doesn't define anything. And it never did. And we could do well to stop worrying so much about cultural background and colour of people's skin and identity politics and all that. It just doesn't fit with what God says. No, when you've been called to the Lord Jesus, you've been called into a family. And as I say, it's a family that is expanding. So would you be wasting your time, do you think, to get on your knees and serve somebody in the family when this is the family that's going to endure into eternity? Would you be wasting your time to work at being one, putting aside grievances with other believers? Would you be wasting your time working hard to expand the kingdom of God as much as it depends upon you by your prayers and by your giving and by the way that you promote the cause of the Lord Jesus? No. It's a great cause. It's a certain cause. And it's really going somewhere very, very wonderful. Uh, this kind of certainty, uh, friends, I think raises the call to love and to be unified to a new level. It's a big deal. So certainty is one of the things out of which a sense of unity grows, I think. And the second one is not certainty, but centrality. Uh, the centrality of God's words. The certainty of God's kingdom, the centrality of God's words. See, what is it, do you think, that makes us one? I mean, a lot of people talk about unity. You can be, you can be on a rugby team and say, yep, we've got a common goal, we've got to win this game. You'll be part of the CWA and say, yep, our goal is to make better scones or whatever these CWA babies do. Uh, I'm part of a political party. Our goal is to get into government or, and so on. So it rolls. You've got certain goals. Well, what is it that makes Christians one? What is it that makes us... What unites us front and centre? Well... It's the words that Jesus, that Jesus gave us. That's what unites us. We're different. We've got different likes and dislikes. We've got different abilities. We've got different interests. We don't all like the same food. We don't all like the same sport. There's a million things that are different among us. But they are never the things that unite us. Those differences are fine. They're part of the wonderful way that God, part of the wonderful variety that God put into the world and put into us. And we, we relish the differences. We don't despise them. So what is it then, if it's, not, if it's not those sort of things that unite us, what is it? Jesus said, I pray that they may be one. How will they be one? I've given them your words. That was true for the disciples. He said back in verse 8, I've given them, the disciples, the words that you gave me. What about us? I do not ask for the disciples only, but also for those who will, will believe in me through their word, through the word of the apostles. Speak, preach, write. It's always been like that. And it's, it's a bit like a relay race, I think. He says back in, uh, earlier in, the, in this prayer, Father, you gave me the words to speak. I gave them to the apostles. And now people believe through their words. Word, 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 here it comes. And we end up, when we embrace these words in our hearts and in our heads, we end up with a unity that's not simply an organisational unity. It's not as though we just sign up to the same club. Uh, it's not as if we just observe the same rules. Uh, no, God's supernatural word, given to the Son, given to the apostles, given to us, changes us and brings us into fellowship with the God who spoke those words. Now, Christian unity is not saying we just need to be part of the same organisation and just sign up 
uh, sign, put our name on the, on, the, on the dotted line at the bottom. It's not like that. It's not as though, to turn it around the other way, it's not as though it's a sin against unity to be in different churches or to be in different denominations. That's not, that's not what he's talking about. The unity is a unity of embracing the word. Wherever we find believers, wherever they are, we're one, we're one, regardless of the organisation of which they're part, regardless of which document they've signed. Those who belong to the Lord Jesus are united. Uh, last, uh, last week in um, the Roman Catholic Cathedral in London, Westminster Cathedral, there was a service, and it was a pretty important service because the Pope had sent his special delegate, Cardinal somebody or other, there to conduct it. And the service was about the reception into the Catholic Church of some a guy who'd been a bishop in the Church of England. And so, uh, I, I, I don't know why, but I wasted an hour and a half watching the whole thing. But he... Here is uh, the line was this. It's been so bad and against God that the Church of England ever started. We should have all been one under the Pope, of course. But now today we're seeing sin reversed as this guy comes back to Mother Church. And that was said to be unity. Now, following the sinful fracturing of unity 400 years ago at the time of the Protestant Reformation. Well, let me tell you, that had nothing to do with biblical unity. It was just a business takeover. Biblical unity is based on the truth of the Bible. This was just an organisational change, bringing this guy into... Uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And, and let me say, on top of that, that uh, the Protestant Reformation was hardly a disaster. It was a time when the truth of God's word was rediscovered. And people said, because this is what it says, we can't stay there, we'll do this. It was a great time. And we never cringe when we think about the Reformation. Quite the opposite. So they had it all wrong on both counts. Now, I've already said, if this, if this is not unity, is unity that we're all the same? No, not at all. There are thousands of differences between us. But when it, when it comes to what God has said through his words, pass on to us from the apostles, from Jesus, from the Father, when we embrace those words and we end up on the same page, following the same Lord Jesus, Believing what he says, as opposed over against what anybody else might say, then there's unity. Now, does that mean, do you think, that we're talking only about a spiritual unity that doesn't really need to show? No. When he prays, when Jesus prays in this prayer, I pray that they may be perfectly one or fully one. I think he mean, I think he said, I want it to be demonstrated that they're one together. They don't hold each other at arm's length. They don't just stand their own dig and just sort of uh, fight for their own cause. Uh, they forgive. They apologise. They wash feet. That's, that's how the unity shows. Not organisationally, but relationally. You know, there's a strange... Uh, I've been troubled this week, I, I confess. I even dreamt about it a few nights... I can't work out exactly what Jesus means in verse 22. And I've read many books and nobody helped me. The glory that you have given me, I, I have given to them, so that they may be one even as we are one. And what was the glory that the Father gave to the Son? I mean, wasn't he always glorious? Eternally? Sure. So what was the glory? The word glory is used so many different ways in the Bible. You've almost got to sort of uh, think about it each time you come across it. Uh, even in this prayer, it's used in different ways, I think. Uh, see if this helps. Uh, when in the Old Testament, 
uh, God was giving Moses uh, the instructions for, for building the tabernacle. And he, he promised that his glory, it's often called the Shekinah glory, that the glory of God would come down and rest on the mercy seat. And what would happen when the glory of God came down? God says in Exodus 25, verse 22, There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat I will speak with you. Glory and words go together. Often when the word glory is used, and I'm pretty sure that's what Jesus means here when he prays. The glory that you've given me, the words you've given me, the way you've spoken to me, I've now spoken to them, I've given them these words, all those who believe, that they may be one even as we are one. I think it's a glory of revealed words. Now friends, just think about that for a tick. When we read the words of Scripture, these are not just ordinary words like you'll read tomorrow in tomorrow's Northern Daily Leader. They're not. They're words of glory from, the, from heaven itself by which God speaks to us and draws near to us by his word, by which he brings us into union with one another. And so that's why if you're going to be a half-decent church, this is where you start. You start with the words, not with opinions, not with traditions. Um, the, the Church of England in England is uh, just right now in dreadful turmoil. The reason being that the bishops who sort of uh, pre presented this uh, paper to, to everybody to be, uh, for practice to be adopted have said, look, we no longer believe what we used to believe about sexual sin. We're changing the rules. We want everybody to take it on board. And there's been a great revolt, as there ought to have been, because they've moved away from what the Bible says to giving their own opinion, which just reflects the culture of the day. And so that's why there's been a mass, uh, a heap of people who've just said, we just can't stay. So Rick O'Tice, uh, Christianity explored Rick O'Tice just a, a choice, a choice servant of the Lord. He says, the bishops are saying we need to walk together. He said, how can we walk together when we're walking in opposite directions? We're walking away from each other. Not together. Because there's nothing that unites us. And if it's not the words of the Lord, then you're left just with the words of the culture. And Rick O'Tice and others have said, no, it's not enough. If we're going to be together, it's got to be on the basis of what, he, what God has said is central. And that's his words. Now, something is really central to true unity. If it's not the word of God come down to us, then whatever else we've got, it's not unity. You can sit in the same room, you can sing the same songs, but if we're not gathered around the word of God that brings us to the Lord Jesus, believe in him through their words, if it's not that, then there's no unity. It doesn't matter how many people sit in the same building. When the, when the Uniting Church of Australia began in um, 1977, uh, churches from mainly Methodist, some Presbyterians, a good number of congregational churches, they got together. And they said, we want to be a new force in Australia. We'll call ourselves not the United Church, but Uniting, because we'll expect others will come in too. They said, now we've got to work out what is it that we believe together. And some said this, and some said that, and some said something else. But they couldn't agree. So when it came to talk about the death of the Lord Jesus, they couldn't agree that his death was an atoning death for the forgiveness of sins. So they said, well, let's just go to the lowest common denominator. What can we agree on? Well, that his death is a good example of how to give yourself for others. We should be generous. And that's it. And that's still the deed of union today in the Uniting Church of Australia. They went to the lowest common denominator. It wasn't the word of God that, com that united them. It was just their own prejudices and unbelief. Not that everybody was an unbeliever, I'm not saying that. But that's, that's when it came to the guys who put it together, uh, that's what it was like. Uh, 
And it's not unity. Unity grows out of something that's central. And what God says is central are his words. You know, when, when Gary Miller, um, who was with us just a few weeks ago, uh, he was speaking last month in May, I think it was, at a conference um, on the Central Coast. And it was called Reach Out Australia. And they'd gathered together for the conference about 1,200 church leaders from around Australia with a view to saying, now, how can we evangel? How can we make a better fist of evangelism in Australia? And he said there, in one of his talks, he said, you know, I make a great mistake as the principal of a theological college in, in Queensland, in Brisbane. He said, I often assume that my students know what I'm talking about and they understand uh, what drives me. He said, but they don't. I've got to tell them. They don't always just see. And he said, his phrase was, people won't know if you don't tell them. So what am I doing right now? I'm telling you. I'm telling you why the Bible is so central to everything that we must do as a church. I'm telling you why we put a high priority on sermons and Bible studies and Bible conversations and Bible conferences and Sharper Minds weekends. I'm telling you why. Because it's that that gives us our unity as we believe the words and come to the Lord Jesus in faith. I'm telling you that if we don't work hard to guard the centrality of the word of God, and if we don't pray for confidence in the certainty of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus, then we'll never be what we should be. It won't be possible. Now, friends, look, can I just say again, just, uh, I don't really have time to say much more than just a quick comment. When we talk about unity, I've, said, I've tried to make clear it's not organisational, it's not a formal thing, it's a relational thing. True unity shows itself relationally as we build ourselves together on the centrality of the word of God. And that shows in a million ways. It means that we worry more about the interests of other people than we do about making our own opinion known. It means that we look for ways to serve and promote other people and their interests above ours. It means that we forgive quickly rather than hold grudges. It means that we get on our knees and do the thing that really nobody wants to do if it's serving others. It means we're quick with an apology. It means we're quick to ask for forgiveness. And if the people around us are those who've been brought into the certain and sure and wonderful kingdom of God, why wouldn't we? I mean, why wouldn't we? So I'm telling you, you say, it's obvious. Well, Gary Miller says, no, it isn't. So I took him to heart. I thought, yep, I'll say it. This is why the centrality of the word of God. Now, when I was at um, Theological College, the principal used to preach. Once he preached several times in the college chapel. And uh, he had one sermon that he preached twice a year, every year. Same sermon. And it was called Prepare and preach properly or perish. The centrality of the word of God. Um, friends, I guess I'm just asking you today to lift your eyes. If you've, if you, if you've forgotten that the kingdom of Jesus is such an ex, so, so certain that every child of God will come in, and that at the end of the world, all the other kingdoms of the world are going to lie in the dust and they'll be remembered never again. But Jesus' kingdom will stand. It's a great kingdom. It's a certain kingdom. And it's a kingdom where the words of Jesus are central. So I'm telling you this, in case you've forgotten that, or in case you've never thought about it, or in case you're in danger of replacing those things with something else, Jesus' prayer leaves us in no doubt about the certainty of his kingdom and what's central in it. So none of us can say, we don't know. His prayer has told us.
Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the magnificence of who he is and what he has done. And we praise you, gracious Father, that he's called every child of God into his family, sovereignly, certainly, and all because of the electing grace of his Father. We thank you that he's building a kingdom which is sure when it is founded upon the words of God himself. Father, may it be that we embrace the things that are precious to him, these things, and may they be deeply precious to us as the church of Jesus. Here we pray and we ask in his name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, there's something